do in the Oxford Martin School and across Oxford uh, reaches a wider uh, community and certainly reaches policy makers uh, in government. The role of the chief scientific advisor has many dimensions including the foresight dimension uh, where the chief scientist is in charge of uh, government science and within that uh, foresight and of course uh, many people across Oxford and the Oxford Martin School have worked on the various foresight activities and will continue to look at them with great interest as they help government and people around the world think about the key future trends, including recently the work that's been done on the future manufacturing, the future in food and farming, which Charles Godfrey, who runs our food and farming group, ran, and many others. Uh, before joining government in uh, early April, I think it was. The first the 1st of April. Um, uh, as chief scientist, uh, Sir Mark was the head of the Wellcome Trust. Uh, many of you will know the Wellcome Trust. It is a very big uh, funding group and thinking group uh, providing over £650 million pounds a year uh, for research and with an endowment of over £13 uh, billion. Pounds. So we look at it with, with envy uh, in terms of its resources uh, and its capabilities. Uh, and responsible for many, many good things across UK and the world in terms of breakthroughs uh, in medicine and other areas. So Mark is a doctor uh, by profession, uh, previously was professor uh, of medicine and then head of medicine at Imperial College uh, in London, uh, has worked very, very widely previously to joining this job with government. Uh, and has an extremely good insight, not only as to know how government's working, but how universities <coughs> work and how we may think about issues. The topic he'll be talking about today, which is making <coughs> sense of big data, is clearly one which is of, of central interest uh, to all of us. How do we drink from the fire hydrant? And I very much look forward to hearing <coughs> Mark's view on that. We'll be, follow that with a discussion, and then you will all be invited to join us for a reception uh, next door at the end of this event. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. I thought there was positive feedback, yes. Thank you very much for that introduction, Ian, and it's a real pleasure to be here. And it's, all a real, it's also a real pleasure with uh, John Beddington here to thank him and pay tribute to him. Uh, he's a very hard act to follow. And although I've been doing the job now for eight months, I can still on a daily basis see the impact that John has had in government. Um, and one of the particular areas that you had a tremendous impact was around our resilience, our well-being, and some of the challenges on the National Risk Register. Um, and how scientific advice feeds into government in emergencies through a committee that you established called Scientific Advice Group in Emergencies. Um, and the question, of course, I suppose at some level is, are we ever going to have to assemble the Scientific Advice Group in emergencies because of big data? Um, and what I thought I would do is I would put a fairly human face on big data in this talk because, of course, as you've already said, Ian, uh, big data is coming <coughs> Uh, in every direction. So uh, the astronomers understood big data before many other areas of science, engineering and technology, but everywhere we look there are big data, uh, huge data sets. And of course the challenge is um, it's very important that we should be open about data wherever we can, uh, but data without metadata aren't of much value and the real challenge for society is turn data into information turn that information into knowledge and use that knowledge wisely. And that, I think, is what the big challenge is all about. Um, it would, I think, not be appropriate to speak today without paying a tribute to uh, the uh, eponymous um, uh, founder of the Martin School, James Martin, who died recently, um, with his comment that the future will not be a repetition of the past. Um, and of course that is true, um, but we might also remember uh, the Spanish-American philosopher George Santayana who reminded us that those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And so I think the challenge of course is that both of these uh, wise men uh, said wise things and we should remember the past as well as 
um, worrying and thinking about the future and recognizing that it won't, of course, be a repetition of the past. Um, it's worth also just uh, <laughs> being a little bit provocative in this great university about um, math, <coughs> statistics, and big data. Um, and of course, people forget that Florence Nightingale was, in fact, a pioneer of statistics. And in the 1890s, she tried to get a professor of statistics established at Oxford University. Um, and um, you can see that the decision-making wheels ground slowly because Oxford began teaching statistics in 1947, um, and the first professor of mathematical statistics was appointed here in 1962. Um, so Florence Nightingale was absolutely right, um, and eventually um, Oxford has got there, but of course it's got there very spectacularly in terms of its more recent contribution. <coughs> So turning to the main subject of my remarks this afternoon, um, I thought I would talk about big data in terms of information about people, because I think that in many ways offers the most opportunities, but it also offers the most challenges. Um, and so I thought I would start by talking a bit about issues of identity and identification, because they're profoundly important when we talk, start talking about data sets that include information about each of us as individuals. Uh, what the opportunities of big data and some of the risks, um, something about privacy and um, where uh, this is all going. So identity is something that is incredibly important to every one of us in this room. It's what makes us what we are, uh, it's the prism through which we view the world. Um, identity is what makes each of us me, as it were. Um, and, of course, our identity is something that only we can really know about. Uh, it contains information that we're happy to disclose to almost anyone in the world, and it also includes information that we hold very dear and will <coughs> share with very few people. So it's an incredibly important part of being human. Um, but of course the corollary of identity is identification. Finding out who others are. Um, and identification is about finding out who you are. Um, and of course society doesn't work properly if we can't identify people. Um, and so who are the people that need to know about us? Well, of course, if we don't disclose our identity at all, then we won't have much in the way of family and friends. So our family and our friends are family and friends because, in fact, well, obviously we have genetic relationships with our family, but within families, within our friendship groups, we disclose an enormous amount about our identities. Um, but the very act of living in a democracy means that government has to know about us in order to enable us to vote. Um, and of course government needs to know about us because for government to operate then we do need taxes and so taxes have to be collected and society needs all sorts of pieces of information in order to function. And of course between our family and friends and government there are all sorts of civic organisations um, and they need to know about us if we're to participate in them and the world of business needs to know about us as well. And the challenge, of course, is how to manage all of that in an <laughs> era in which digital interchange of information is becoming absolutely ubiquitous and pervasive. And, of course, each of us have effectively multiple identities. So we manage our relationships essentially by disclosing different subsets of data to different organisations. So we have an identity at home as a parent, as a husband, as a all sorts of relationships. Uh, we have a different relationship at work. Um, we have relationships with clubs. We have all sorts of different relationships and increasingly we have online relationships of a sort that were never possible or thought of before. And so we disclose, and here's just some examples of the things we disclose in different contexts using our different identities. And in fact, we're all perfectly comfortable with these multiple identities um, and it, it doesn't, it, it's part of being human that we're able to manage these differential disclosures without, on the whole, worrying about it too much. 
Um, and of course, as I've already said, the flip side of identity is identification. And of course, there are all sorts of ways that the outside world uses to identify us. So it, it uses very direct disclosures to identify us. So a passport contains lots of information about us, as does a driving license. And of course, there are lots of places I go where I have to show a passport or a driving license or something like that. Uh, work passes are pretty pervasive. There are things that will identify us in a health service, such as an NHS number or a national insurance number. And then, of course, there are other ways that are um, slightly less disclosive but very important in terms of identifying us, so the use of credentials and tokens. Um, and one of the challenges for most of us, I think, is the increasing number of PIN numbers and passwords that we all have to remember and hopefully not use repetitively because that creates all sorts of security risks. And increasingly, there are things like RFID embedded devices, which are important in terms of identifying um, us and things as well. Um, and one of the big challenges, and this is a real issue in terms of data regulation, is to actually define what is really personal information. Um, and it's something that's easy to say, but actually quite hard to define. And I think that we would all recognize the stuff in the top set of photographs as being pretty direct disclosure of identity. So our name, um, our face, our fingerprint, our DNA sequence, these are all things that are obviously very directly disclosive or indirectly in the case of DNA because you have to need to know quite a lot of other information. But then there are all the indirect pieces that are sometimes known, sometimes called personal information, depending a bit on the context. So an address um, is potentially personal information together with other information. Our postcode can be quite disclosive, where we work, the clubs. And, and one of the challenges is actually to define what the limits of personal information actually are. And that's an area where uh, Europe has been struggling around uh, data regulation, the new, the, the, the new data uh, regulation that's being developed at the moment, which is how do you actually define what is personal information? And personal information is personal in one context, but sometimes not in another. Um, and of course, different attributes are more or less sensitive in different contexts. Um, so sometimes age is a sensitive issue, oftentimes it isn't. Um, sex, nationality, religion, health, <coughs> education, financial information, football team you support, sometimes sensitive, sometimes quite insensitive. And the illustration is of the application that Richard Nixon made to the FBI in 1937, uh, which was released under Freedom of Information. Um, and you can see that the release wasn't very disclosive. Um, but um, it just makes the point about what is sensitive and what isn't. Um, and of course, one of the challenges and of course the opportunities is that we now have all sorts of new opportunities to create identities that we never had before. So we can create Twitter identities, YouTube identities, Facebook identities. I think I don't even know what all these icons are. There are so many of them now. And of course, people variously create, use their real identity for these. Uh, they create uh, pseudonymous identities, um, Mickey Mouse or something like that. Uh, they try and be as anonymous as they possibly can. Um, and one of the challenges, of course, is that whilst on the one hand it's possible to create um, all sorts of more or less obfuscation of identity on the web, the technology to re-identify people is more and more powerful as well. And that's one of the challenges that I'll come on to. So our identity in an online world, in a world of big data, has become very much more complicated than it ever was before. And of course, in the context of big data, what we're seeing is, and the Foresight Programme, and it's again one that John initiated on the future of manufacturing, has made the point that looking at manufactured products of the future, they increasingly will have information technology embedded in them in ways that weren't thought of before. And so jet engines already send continuously information on their health in flight back so that they can be monitored continuously. But we can see more and more things where they are IT enabled. And some of that IT enabling will give quite important disclosive information about us. So uh, Google Glasses may tell us something about um, 
we look at something and it tells us what it is, um, what you can buy there, what it costs elsewhere. Uh, but those Google Glasses will also tell where you are as well, the person that's wearing them. So quite a lot of the information technology that's embedded actually tells a lot about the person that is using the product, about where they are. And so we're generating massive amounts of information from what is called the Internet of Things. Um, and I think that has extraordinary potential, both in terms of providing new products that we want, new services enabling the monitoring of, of, of products that we buy, um, but it generates more and more data about us. So why do we all do this? And of course the truth is that much of this data is used by each of us for our personal everyday utility. So we use the internet, we find things out, we tell other people things, we navigate real worlds, we navigate fictional worlds, and we have identities in fictional worlds. Uh, we buy stuff, we sell stuff. So there's plenty of reasons that this is becoming so pervasive, because it is actually useful. Um, and of course, on the bottom, you see that um, some of us use these things for our personal utility in ways that are damaging to others, such as stealing things and plotting and causing harm. Um, and as I've already said, um, this is an iPhone tracking data. Um, information technology suddenly creates extraordinary new ways of seeing how we move around. Um, and we give away an enormous amount of information that others can then use. Um, and here's another example of, th this was fascinating, this was a project that I uh, visited recently in Austin in Texas which is starting to understand people's energy use in the home using smart metering. And so this is the smart meter profile of uh, not exactly a typical American household because you can see that they, this is a household that has an electric car. Um, and, but you can see what happens during the, the night and the day and you can see that they're out to work during the day. Um, so uh, if you want to rob the house at this time, this is quite a good time to do it because there's no energy consumption in the house at the moment. Um, but you can then see that they get home um, and they turn on virtually all their electricity and then in fact they plug in their car to recharge. And so you can see this peak use of um, electricity in the evening um, and then they go to bed at night um, and um, it's... Um, air conditioning that's the, the, the main use of the electricity in the night. Um, now of course this is important because one of the challenges on energy is not only to reduce our use but to even out our use of electricity um, and this is extremely powerful information uh, potentially in helping consumers plan their energy consumption um, more effectively and you can immediately see that it isn't sensible in an ideal world to charge your car at the same point as you put on your air conditioning and all your other household appliances. Um, so you can start seeing the power of this and uh, you know, ideally you would be charging your car at a time when you're not using electricity for other things. Um, but this is generating a massive amount of quite personal data about information. And the question is, how should this be used in the most effective fashion? And we can see both the utility of it, but also the potential downside. Um, and the price of all this utility is that we are generating data on an absolutely gigantic scale. Um, and I don't know about brontobytes, but anyway, we are generating very large exponentials of data. Um, and with all of this, it's interesting to debate who knows the most about each of us, actually. Um, and people worry about government, and they worry about big brothers, inverted commas. But actually, if you look at who knows the most about us in terms of collecting information, arguably it's the private sector that in most cases knows much more about us than government. So you can look at the one hand about what the Office of National Statistics know about each of us, and then you can ask the question what Google knows about each of us in terms of how we use the internet, the searches we make, um, the adverts that we click through to. Who knows most about our finance? Is it HMRC or is it experience, Experian, a, a credit checking agency? Um, who knows, well, about uh, in, in terms of health, uh, the NHS knows a certain amount about us, but the use of our loyalty cards tells the private sector, an enormous amount about our shopping habits 
And in fact, there's a lot of information there that tells them actually quite a lot about our health in terms of what we buy, how we move around, how we, how we, how we use things. Um, and of course, for us, the data is used. It helps provide individual services to us. Um, but of course, it's also aggregated for wholesale purposes, and much of that information is then uh, either given or sold to other organisations who use it to sell things and market things to us. And there's a lot of discussion about consent, but I think there's also an enormous mythology about consent. So each of us, when we sign on to our credit card or our um, store card or anything else, will have ticked a box saying we consent to all those uses. But I challenge anyone in this room whether you've really read and scrolled down all of the uh, small print, and it is quite small print. And sometimes what's called consent is really conditions of supply that you actually, we know that if you want a new piece of software, basically you can't get it unless you tick the box saying I accept all the terms and conditions. And so again, I think what probably 95% of us do, and I admit to this, is you tick the box because it's the only way you'll use the software. And so that's how the private sector, how does government use it? Um, government uses it, I've already said, it enables us to vote. Um, government uses it to help plan uh, where are housing needs. Um, it certainly uses it to collect taxes. Um, and it uses information for law enforcement. Um, and it's just worth saying, I think, with all of the furore that there's recently been over um, the um, Edward Snowden, that there is an enormous amount of work that's done in government using data to protect us on a day-to-day -day basis. And we must be extremely careful that we don't throw out the baby with the bathwater in terms of security. And it's not only government that uses it, but there's an issue about employers, both present and future. Um, and stories abound of people who suddenly realised that posting things on Facebook wasn't terribly wise. Um, there's the whole issue of cyber security in relation to hostile and competing foreign states. There are all the opportunities for crime and terrorism. Um, and journalists quite like using personal and other information as well. So there's an awful lot happening out there. And, of course, I've already said that data on its own is not terribly interesting stuff. It only <coughs> becomes interesting when you actually have the metadata and start adding value to it. And what, of course, is happening is that the technology for adding value to large data sets is increasing at an extraordinary pace. Um, and that's an area where this university and others are very active, and we've moved from simply a simple statistics where we plot the data sets, we compute the statistics, to a world in which we train prediction engines, to full probabilistic modelling where we can actually start working out how data might even be created in the future. So this is very, very fast moving indeed. And I don't want to sound too negative about all this because actually the opportunities are absolutely fantastic. Basically, if you want to improve things, then you need to be able to measure them. And so, in the world that I came from, which is health, if we really want to hold health systems to account, if we want to deliver the best health, then we have to use clinical information to do that. And which among us actually doesn't want, if we have diabetes or another disease, to use information about our illness to help others with the same condition? If we really want the best hospitals, then we need to make sure that clinical information is used and the purpose of using data in health is actually to improve health care. Um, it still frustrates me that we don't share clinical records between our primary care practitioner and hospitals. It's ridiculous that we have four or five different sets of health records, uh, some of them not even sharing the, quite the right date of birth and things like that. So the power of data in order to improve health, research in general, to improve business, um, to improve policy around cities, around mobility, um, in fact to provide better services to us as customers, to improve security, the opportunities are absolutely gigantic 
and the challenge is how to balance those benefits with associated risks about privacy, and I'll come on to that in, in a minute. Um, and then, of course, at the individual level, there's lots that we can do with data, the number of people that are now wearing things that are uh, these wristbands that monitor our exercise. Um, these will give us direct utility um, in terms of improving our health um, and in all sorts of other aspects of our function, giving information about the outside world as we move around it. And here's just one example that I like um, of how data, big data, are used to improve health. And this is an example from Scotland, where all of the diabetics, um, and this is now a little bit out of date, but on their database they had 251,132 people with diabetes, um, uh, of which about 27,000 had type 1 diabetes, single database, and they've used it to drive up the quality of health care. So whereas any medical student would have been told that you need to measure the blood pressure, the renal function, uh, the blood sugar, something called the hemoglobin A1C, which is a long-term measure of um, how much carbohydrate there is attached to, other mul uh, to hemoglobin. Um, the fact of the matter is that a sig significant fraction of patients with diabetes didn't have all of these things measured. Once you start measuring it, you can then drive up the performance. And now in Scotland, virtually every patient with diabetes will have all of these things measured on a regular basis. And they've used that to drive down the complications of diabetes. So the amputation rate in diabetes in Scotland has been dropped by 40%. Uh, the amount of laser eye surgery needed has been dropped by 40%. By just using health data properly to drive accountability of health care. So the opportunities are potentially absolutely enormous. And here are other examples where um, uh, here's a, an app that uh, for those that spend time in London is extremely useful. It's called City Mapper and it works in New York as well. It really helps us to get around our cities better. It knows where the buses are, it knows where the tubes are, um, it knows um, how long it'll take to get there. So increasingly, by collecting data about transport in real time, uh, <coughs> we're seeing obvious utility to individuals. And here's an app that I particularly like that is used in Boston, but I can think of, it would certainly be useful in London, I can tell you, is, a, is, is an app called Street Bump. Um, and here's crowdsourced information where you put your um, accelerometer-enabled um, uh, smartphone on your dashboard, and as it goes over a bump, the accelerometer is triggered and a <coughs> signal is sent to Street Bump Central uh, saying that there is a bump at this point. And of course, by then crowdsourcing it, they can then work out which are the, the bumps that indicate the likelihood that there is in fact a pothole in the road um, and use it to fix it. Um, and again, that has obvious utility, but also we have to recognise that of course each time your phone sends a message that you've gone over a bump, then actually it's told someone that you, the owner of that phone, at the location of that bump, um, and you may or may not want the location of that bump and the fact that you were there to be known by others. And so the balance is between crowdsourced information, where the truth is that street bump doesn't <coughs> care a bit who you are, with the fact that someone malicious might be quite interested in who you are and where you are. And that's always the balance that we're having to strike. Um, and moving to some of the potential harms, and actually we have to recognise that the people who are interested in causing harm are often technologically extremely savvy, and I'll show you some examples in the next minute or two. So one piece of research with um, over 50,000 volunteers started looking at algorithms <coughs> that they derived from what people like on Facebook and discovered that they could be 95% accurate in distinguishing uh, racial origins, so an African-American from Caucasian-American. Uh, they could differentiate Republicans from <coughs> Democrats uh, from people's Facebook likes. And I mean, perhaps that isn't very surprising that they could work out. There were some slightly odd links as well, which is that apparently curly liking curly fries correlated with high intelligence. Um, but I was always told that causation and correlation are not the same thing. <coughs> Um, here's a slightly more, a uh, couple more um, uh, dangerous examples, I think. Um, so America Online um, released anonymized search data or search data that they thought were anonymized for research purposes. Uh, but there was enough information in the search data 
for journalists to be able to pick up sufficient clues to identify the names and locations of people and then triangulate them with the search queries that people might not like, have liked to be revealed. Um, and that program didn't last very long and its initiators didn't last very long either. Um, and here's another example which illustrates the, the power of mashing together two different data sets. So uh, Netflix, uh, which was interested in optimizing its recommendation algorithms, um, set a, basically they released anonymized film rental data um, together with a $1 million prize uh, for the best example of how recommendation algorithms could be improved. Um, now, of course, you, you'll realize that people don't necessarily want all the films that they like renting on Netflix to be made public. Um, and what happened was that some uh, smart and slightly malicious individual triangulated the Netflix data with the IMDB database um, where people can identify themselves were able to identify some of the individuals um, whose uh, Netflix and IMDB data uh, were correlated with each other. And by doing that, they were able to really reveal the list of rentals um, of films that people hadn't necessarily rated and didn't necessarily want most people to know that they were interested in watching. Um, and this is a very real and slightly dangerous example of how, by mashing together two data sets, you can re-identify people when Netflix thought that they had properly anonymized it. So that takes us into the whole issue of privacy and how we manage it. And I think probably this is the most um, important of the, the slides that I'm showing you this afternoon. Um, and I think that we have to recognize that privacy is sometimes thought of as a slightly all or nothing thing. But privacy is actually not, the controls are not binary they fall on spectra. And one can look at it in privacy in terms of three ways. There's the obfuscation of the data itself. There's the access and the environment in which data is held. And then there's the governance and accountability. And one can view each of them as being sliders on <coughs> spectra. Whereas on obfuscation, you can have openly identified. So, you know, the name Mark Walport attached to certain sets of data. At the other end, you can anonymize it absolutely totally, but when you anonymize it totally, it then potentially starts to lose valuable content. And so there's a spectrum between anonymizing it absolutely totally and making it openly identifiable. And that's a sort of spectrum of obfuscation. But it then matters where you hold data. So again, you can put the name free on the internet, in which case, everyone has access to it, or at the other end, you can lock it in a metaphorical steel-lined room. Um, and that would be a place where you would only let in an accredited researcher. And one of the very important potential protections for data that has the potential to be re-identified is the concept of the safe haven. So a safe haven is an environment in which there are very strict rules about people not trying to re-identify people from uh, data sets um, and where you can provide additional <laughs> controls by only letting people in that are accredited in a particular way. Um, and then, of course, there is the third level of controls, which is around governance and accountability, where one can, at one end of the spectrum, have little or no legislation and no accountability to the other end, highly legislated, where if people break the rules about data access, about de-anonymization, then very severe penalties follow. Um, and I think that we have to recognize that if we are to, on the one hand, get the maximum benefit from large data sets that contain potentially identifiable information, then what we have to do is to adjust the sliders on these three uh, controls to optimize access on the one hand, whilst preventing harm on the other. And that is perfectly achievable. Um, but I think that part of the challenge in the discourse that we have around privacy is that it tends to be thought of as all or nothing. And that takes me right back to the beginning of my talk when I talked about what is a personal identifier and what isn't. And there are some things that are personally identifying in some contexts, but are not in others. 
And of course, for many of the research uses that data is needed for, then the actual research investigator, the, the individuals that are using large data, are in general not in the slightest bit interested in the identity of the individuals that are in the database. And so it's how we balance the benefits and the risk. And I've already said a bit about this. Uh, when I was a young doctor, it was considered that you could publish the face of a patient in a medical journal if you put that sort of bar across their eyes, uh, which of course is a complete joke because everyone knows that actually if it's a recognizable face, you can recognize the person with that. Um, and there are, so there is anonymization where you really do remove all identifiers such that it's impossible to identify an, an individual. Um, uh, you can encrypt it, so you can basically prevent it from being read without actually unlocking it. Um, and then for many purposes, what you do is you use tokenization or pseudonymization, which is that you remove as much of the personal information as you can and substitute a token or a key, which is then held um, in a separate um, independent database. Um, and of course, there are tools that you can use to increase privacy. So, um, for example, uh, there are situations in which you can actually add a small amount of noise into databases uh, to actually prevent uh, in, uh, in the identification of an individual from a set of individuals. Um, uh, but of course, whilst that works in some situations, if you actually want to find the real needle in the haystack, then that degree of obfuscation may, may prevent you from doing that. Um, I've said a little bit about safe havens, and I think that these are actually a very powerful tool. Uh, they're essentially a, a library of sorts, but where controlled access is granted only to people who have the right credentials. Um, and that dramatically reduces the risk of malicious use of data. Um, and there is an example of, there's a, a, a recent report the, uh, the, from the Administrative Data Research Network, is a scheme that would potentially make a government and other data available in safe havens. Um, but it's yet to be decided whether that's going to happen or not. Um, on data sharing, it's very important when one thinks about the provision of services to individuals to recognize that there is symmetry. In other words, harm can potentially be done by sharing information about people, but it can equally be done by not sharing information. And people sometimes forget that. And there are many examples where one's seen events where people have come to harm that could have been prevented if common sense had been applied in terms of sharing of personal information. And here we're talking about retail services, if I can put it that way, rather than wholesale services. In other words, when health services, when social services, when police services deal with individuals. And there, that's about professionalism and judgment and working out, actually, whether you're going to do less harm by sharing or by not sharing. Um, and the reality is that although the Data Protection Act is blamed for a lot of the circumstances in which data are not shared, it's rarely, in reality, the real bar barrier to sharing information in terms of delivering individual services to individual. Um, and one of the challenges at the moment is the evolving uh, European data protection regulation, um, which is uh, currently uh, working its way through Brussels. And there are some challenges there as to whether it might make um, some important research, medical research, social science research, um, illegal. And we've got to watch that very carefully. Uh, one of the other challenges, of course, and one of the and I sometimes say that there are really no new principles in the world of big data because a lot of the issues about sharing data, the harms, the benefits, actually apply for small data sets as well. Uh, but one of, the, one of the things that has changed, of course, is that data no longer um, is strictly aligned to um, geographical boundaries. And so this is a map of the world looking at undersea internet cables. Um, and, of course, data sets travel um, in extraordinary ways around the world. So um, a, a crimes can be committed in one jurisdiction by criminals operating in another. And that's a new challenge, an important one. We recently held a seminar on the science of privacy um, in Cambridge. Um, and the conclusion of that work is that 
even if a data set is effectively anonymized on its own, and this is actually a very difficult thing to do, if that data set is made freely available, it can often, not always, be decrypted by finding overlaps with other data sets. And the example that I gave you from the world of um, films and film preferences illustrates that. And of course, these could be a mixture of public and private data sets. And so I think in the discussion about data and how we handle big data sets containing personal information, um, we have to be very straightforward. And the bottom line is that it's very hard to totally guarantee privacy. But having said that, there is an enormous amount that we can do to protect it. So to wind up, I think there are some tough challenges ahead. Um, there's no question that the digital infrastructure creates both new threats and vulnerabilities, as well as uh, some of the opportunities I've talked about. And of course, when the internet and the web was originally designed, um, high-level security considerations weren't planned into it in the first place. Um, and as we know and have discovered to our cost, the keys to cryptography are only as secure as those that hold them. Um, and it was Juvenal who said, Equis custodia ipsus custodies, who guards the guardians? Um, and there is a question as to whether and how big data should be on government's national risk registers. And so I think the issue moving forward is that I think we have to have a clear and honest discussion, both about the potential for big data, but also the potential risks associated with it. Um, and um, I hope again that John will resonate with this slide, which is that there is a confusion between hazard and risk in public discourse. Um, and we live in a world surrounded everywhere we go by hazards. So our kitchen is full of hazards, it's full of knives, uh, salt is dangerous if you swallow too much of it, uh, bleach is certainly dangerous. So there are lots of hazards, but we manage them by reducing our exposure to them. Um, and so here is a crocodile uh, with a goose thinking it's safely protected from it by the wire fence. So a hazard in an absence of exposure doesn't present risk. Um, but you can see that the um, goose in the bottom is definitely exposed to the hazard at quite a high level. Um, and that presents uh, s existential risk to the goose. Um, and so what we have to do when we're managing data, uh, particularly data that contains potentially sensitive information about us, is that what we have to do is we have to recognize the hazard. And what we have to do is then manage the risk by reducing the exposure. And that involves going back to the slide I showed you of the three sliders. And we have to think in each context how those sliders should be adjusted so that on the one hand we can protect our uh, privacy, but on the other hand get the benefits that I think many would recognize by the proper use of data. And I think there are all sorts of discussions and questions about how the internet, about how social media will affect how we think about disclosure of personal information, about how we think about our autonomy, our identity, and about privacy. Um, and again, one of the challenges is that it is extremely difficult to completely erase a digital past. And maybe future generations should require the right to be forgiven rather than the right to be forgotten, because who amongst us has not committed youthful indiscretions? Um, but we are beginning to see young people being more thoughtful about their data and, uh, for example, swapping Facebook for Snapchat, uh, WhatsApp and all sorts of other platforms um, that I'm not sure I fully know about or understand. Um, and so looking to the future, one could take a utopian or a dystopian future uh, view of the future. And of course, you know, the promise of big data, the promise of the internet, the promise of um, really, the, the digital library of Alexandria <coughs> is that knowledge is power. And what the internet <coughs> offers all of us, and what I suspect all of us use on a daily basis, is that extraordinary encyclopedia that is the internet and all of its content. Um, <coughs> it does provide knowledge. It has the potential to increase global education. It has the opportunities I illustrated in healthcare to provide better accountability. Using information 
uh, has got to be part of how we achieve sustainability in terms of how we measure resources, how we use resources, how we provide accountability. Uh, but the other side of the coin is the dystopian future, which is how somehow uh, the, uh, the new world uh, disrupts our individuality, it disrupts the fabric of society, it changes childhood. Uh, you can see all the sort of nasty visions as well. Um, and, uh, but I'm an optimist, and I think that if we use our big data well, if we provide the protections, uh, but we must be honest about it and say that we, we would be wrong to say to people we can absolutely guarantee your anonymity because, as we all know, there are occasions when that cannot be absolutely done. And so moving to the forward, the challenge, I think, is that we need to use the technology effectively. So we're good at this in the UK. We need to support the science. We need to support the skills agenda. Uh, we need to communicate effectively um, and we need good governance, so we need to use uh, places like safe havens, we need to have appropriate penalties, and we need to be proportionate in how we use big data. So to finish off, uh, I don't think there's any going back. Um, we are going through this disruptive uh, change at the moment, um, and the world we live in is increasingly um, altered by the digital revolution. These are enormously powerful new tools for understanding ourselves and the world in which we live. Uh, they offer huge economic opportunities um, and there are undoubtedly both unforeseen benefits and unforeseen harms. As I've shown you, the internet has no borders um, and we need to understand that there will be ever more scope for crime and terrorism in cyberspace. Um, and the counter of that, if we're to protect ourselves, is that we have to take advantage of our great strengths in cybersecurity. Um, and I would just challenge everyone that I think we need to stay at the leading edge. Our regulation needs to be proportionate. We need to have appropriate legislation, appropriate accountability. And we need a very good level of public debate. And I hope that's what this evening is about. Thank you for your attention. fantastic uh, way of helping us to understand uh, this incredibly complex area of data, privacy, uh, and the revolutionary changes that are happening in our lives. Uh, we welcome a discussion, comments, and questions. If you'd like to identify yourselves, please do. Be aware that this is all being data captured and live webcast <laughs> as you speak. So if you don't want to be live webcast, I'll just show your face, but don't say anything. <laughs> Um, yeah, the gentleman with the, yeah. Hi, um, I, 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 technology tends to come before social change and I think a lot of people in their teens and their 20s and their 30s are kind of waking up to the idea that you can just share things and not be so concerned about your, your privacy. Um, I mean, you know, someone proposed 25 years ago, the idea that put all your ev all your everyday thoughts, your photos, and um, and uh, and tell you tell some some company about your uh, your friends list and everyone that you know uh, onto a website. I think people would go, oh, I'm not so sure about that. Yeah. But now, but now everyone does it and takes it for granted. So surely, it, it, privacy will not be so much of a problem in 10, 50, or 100 years time as we consider it to be now. Well, I mean, that's obviously a very interesting question, and, and, and who knows? And, and I, I, it's interesting, at, at, at a meeting recently, Frank Kelly used the metaphor of the, uh, who's a very distinguished statistician, who was the chief scientist at the Department of Transport, used the metaphor of the motor car. And so when the motor car was introduced, uh, people got worried if it went above about five miles an hour, and people walked in front of it with a red flag and thought it was an extremely dangerous thing. Uh, but then the utility of it for driving quite fast was discovered very rapidly. And we now accept a society in which actually a number of people get killed every day by people driving too fast. And so you're absolutely right. The technology, our use of the technology evolves. Um, and we balance 
um, the, the benefits and the risks to us. And I mean, that's clearly something that is in active evolution around um, uh, the, our use of the internet, um, the web. Um, and of course, the nature of privacy of human relationships has changed very dramatically over time as well. So we've moved from being rural dwellers, small communities, probably very low level of privacy. You know, if you live in a tiny community uh, without, uh, everything is pretty apparent, um, to a, an urban society where actually people have been, been able to live in almost total isolation. So you hear the tragic stories of the person that's found dead in the flat, you know, with neighbors who've just basically ignored the fact that so-and-so hasn't been seen until the smell becomes too overwhelming. So it's not that we actually haven't seen an evolution in how people think about privacy and how they manage their disclosures. And who knows what will happen in relation to how we think about disclosures <laughs> with this new technology. Um, I think it's an interesting question, and actually at the end of the day, we can do uh, social science research and understand it, and as you say, people's attitudes have changed, uh, but I think this is one of the unforeseen consequences, of, or unforeseeable consequences of where we're going. Thank you for an excellent talk. Yep. Uh, one interesting, po uh, since I come from an institute that specializes in doom and gloom of uh, interesting ways, I think I found a way of getting big data onto the natural risk register. And that's because of IBM Watson. Yeah. So the idea of IBM Watson is essentially you have a big database of rather unstructured information. You can ask it questions. And it turns out, uh, at least in some domains, to be amazingly good at figuring out answers. And uh, right now we're working on using this in medicine, but I've uh, heard clearly that people are talking, this would be really useful for government data, which it does indeed seem to be true. Quite often people, including high-ranking decision makers, wonder what their own departments are doing and would love to be able to ask mm. the computer about new pieces of information. The problem is, of course, that sometimes you can ask a question that gives you very unforeseen answers. Yeah. Especially since this is a, what the whole Watson methodology is essentially putting together a lot of data sets. And uh, as the Cambridge meeting pointed out very accurately, when you put together different data sets, then you get these unexpected breaches of privacy. Not only breaches of privacy, but also of security. So I'm getting to the point. It seems like the best strategy would be to figure out not how to prevent this from happening, because it's going to happen, but mm. rather how do we handle it when we get our data system that are now revealing a dangerous form of information when you ask the right question. And the question is out there in the open. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think the, the, the big challenge with all of this is that um, this is a technology which has the potential to do both good things and bad things, potentially. And the question is that because something has the potential to do bad, does that therefore mean that one shouldn't use it to do good? And I think that's, you know, that's the big challenge, and it's the danger if the discussion doesn't go in sensible ways, that we might end up stopping doing the good things because we have the potential to do the bad things. Um. But, but it's Robert preventing when we know that some bad things are going to happen. No, no, this, this is yeah. Being, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. The gentleman behind you there. Thank you for an excellent talk. Um, you discussed, uh, or you talked about direct and indirect disclosures yeah. of privacy, and you also pointed out how complex uh, maintenance of uh, one's privacy is, yeah. but I would like, wouldn't, uh, couldn't there be an easy solution where w you pointed out how you answer yes to something because you want to get the service? Yeah. Uh, so that's that's a that's a way of measuring it. So couldn't you also um, ask companies to provide you with the data that they have about you? Not that you could erase it, but at least you would know what the companies know about you. Google does that already. On their dashboard, you can see what they collect. And then you can opt out of it or choose another service. Um, and if you were to do that, could that also, I mean, I, I can't imagine in that world, NSA or GCHQ leaks happening because you would know the unknown unknowns, which, uh, which is data being collected about you without you having ever disclosed anything or volunteered or, or signed a checkbox. <coughs> so could that be a solution? Um, so, so I mean, there's the Freedom of Information Act, which, of course, applies to data held by public bodies. Um, and, of course, it makes sense at one level to say, okay, what do you know about me at any one time? But, of course, that could in itself become an enormous... It, it, it could... 
there, there's an opportunity cost and a real financial cost that comes with that. Um, it would be a reasonable thing to ask. Where I think I have less, I, I, I'm more doubtful, is whether you could then necessarily opt out. Because some of the information that the credit card companies use, for example, is actually used to prevent fraud happening. And actually, basically, if you say, I want to opt out of this, then they can't provide the service anymore. So in some cases, the service that you're being provided is actually genuinely dependent on them using the information properly. Um, and the reality is, although it's a pain in the neck, when I get phoned because I happen to be in some obscure airport using my credit card and they say, you know, the computer picks up the fact that I shouldn't be there, um, I don't mind that. But you, you, so one, it's not that actually that these companies are collecting it for bad purposes. They are collecting it in order to deliver the services we want. Um, and as, as someone said recently, you know, the, the, the primary purpose of uh, big data is the secondary use of it. Uh, so, Mark, could you talk a little bit more about the upsides? I mean, you've presented this trade-off between privacy versus all the cool stuff we could do. So yeah. Tell, tell us a bit about the cool stuff. Well, I, okay, so you, you, you've answered my question for me because you, I think everyone knows there is lots of cool stuff you can do with information. So I'm not sure whether you would call providing better health care cool. I think it's pretty important. Um, but, you know, in almost every walk of life, you can see how the power of large data sets to provide better services, to give you the information, to plan better policy... How can government plan policy if it doesn't have the, the core information about the citizens in order to provide the services they need? So uh, in, in almost every walk of life, you can see the opportunities to use data for the benefit of us as individuals and as society. I just think you know, it would be very easy to just go on for hours and hours about the opportunities. Um, but what I wanted to do was balance those opportunities with some of the sort of slightly more difficult issues. Um, Um, <clears throat> I wanted to ask a question which you haven't entirely covered, but right. it's, it's relevant, I think, to, to big data, which is the question of energy, the amount of yeah. energy that's needed to uh. store the data, to transfer yeah. the data um, from A to B. I mean, I've heard it said that the IT industry now has a bigger <laughs> carbon footprint than the airline industry. So in your exponential growth from petabytes to exabytes to yottabytes and so on and so forth, when's this going to pose a, a, a real threat to the national grid? Um, well, I don't think it poses a threat to the national grid yet, but you are absolutely correct that um, uh, this is an energy-intensive activity. Um, and if you've ever been in a large data centre, then you're aware that you're in the presence of, you know, um, many, many kilowatts of heating, um, and therefore the air conditioning that goes with that to cool it down. Um, and so, yes, um, that is part of the story. Um, I don't think it's, um, and I stand to be corrected, but I doubt if it's anything near the airline industry yet. But, John, do you have a view on that? I think it's bigger than airlines. And is airline it? industry is something like 4 or 5% of global carbon emissions, and I think IT is well over 10 or 8. Is it? Uh, mm. At least in big cities. Mm. Um, the gentleman behind you. Just very quickly, and I hope this isn't the last question because this is a bit of a doom and gloom one. Yeah. Um, if data and the internet have no boundaries, governments do have boundaries, how, how does governments and our responsibility work? Um, governments are, democratic governments are elected by us as citizens. And the way we express our displeasure <coughs> is, to, is, by, is by the use of the ballot box, is the answer to that. Um. It looks like the right hand side is uh, no more hands. So the, the, the gentleman there uh, with the stuff back for it. Yeah, that's fine. Hi. Um, is there not a risk as we use more data that we start forgetting about those things that are not easily measurable or reducible to data? That, in, that policy uh, responses and policy decisions become based on those things that are easy or susceptible to, to datafication? And we forget about other, other aspects that might be harder to quantify? Um, well, I mean, that, that, that is true, but there are an awful lot of useful and important things that we can measure, which are important for making policy decisions. 
Um, and yes, it, you know, it's a truism that, 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 uh, that not everything you measure is important, and some of the stuff that is very important you can't measure. I mean, that's certainly true. Uh, but it doesn't alter the fact that actually there is an awful lot of very useful stuff you can measure and make you know, sensible decisions based on it. Thank you so much. Uh, Salam Safrini from Said Business School. Uh, my question is um, whether legislators and businesses have been focusing too much on privacy issues and not too much on identity theft. Sorry, say it again. Are we focusing too much on uh, privacy and not identity theft? Well, I mean, they're both, they're both important. But, I mean, again, one of the things that is, is will be well known is that uh, one of the new risks, and, of course, it's not a risk that's... that's um, uh, this risk did not I originate in the digital era. Identity theft has always been you know, a potential criminal activity. Um, and there are just new, new um, and different ways to commit identity theft. So, yes, it's important, but it's not actually... Uh, there's nothing new about that. Um, so, obviously, um, as researchers and academics kind of come up with kind of productive uses to kind of analyse big data and they, they potentially start up companies in, in universities across the country, why is it that in the UK, and in Europe in fact, we lack quite significantly in comparison to, say, the States, where uh, kind of innovation in, for instance, big data um, it's kind of a, a big deal. Why, why is it that we don't kind of put as much emphasis on it? <coughs> Sorry, are you, are you saying that it's less valued in the UK and Europe than it is in the States? By, by governments and... Um, I don't, I'm not sure that I agree that's true, actually. Um, uh, there's, uh, there's no question that the, you know, the internet and internet businesses that have come from them are a very important uh, source of economic activity. That's certainly recognised by the UK government. Um, and I'm not sure there is any fundamental philosophical difference, at least between the UK and the US. Um, you can look at history and say, well, why, you know, what's the explanation for the fact that Silicon Valley spawned so many startups? Maybe the finance was easy. There's all sorts of factors that you can account for. But I don't think that there's any sort of fundamental philosophical difference between the UK and the US in, in attitudes. I'm sure, I'm sure politicians across the pond both agree that, you know, that's yeah. important. But and when it comes down to funding, I think there's a big difference in the, the levels of funding that um, universities and uh, governments kind of spend on funding, for instance, projects involving big data. Um, you, only have to, you only have to look at you know, the kind of innovation in, in um, we certainly don't knack it, we don't knack the talent, but there's certainly a disparity between um, funding levels um, in the UK and Europe for, for projects involving like that. Um, but I think that's a more general question about uh, funding for innovation for new companies. And the US is a, a larger economy that has, in, at least in recent years, been very successful at doing this. But um, I, I assure you that there's plenty of people in the government that would like the UK to be equally successful. And it's not just public funding, of course, it's private funding as well that's important in all of this. Mm, so. Sorry, if Hang on, sorry. The, uh, uh, you need the mic. Need a someone microphone. else first. I'll come back to you in a minute. Okay. Yep. So I understand that uh, you talked about the uh, positive aspects and negative aspects mm. about this uh, data, and certainly I just uh, understand that the positive uh, things are far greater than the negative aspects of the data. But I, I was just thinking about you know all these uh, electro electronic signals and uh, mobile signals that are being bombarded everywhere, and they are everywhere. So just thinking that, uh, what, are you, wh what is your view about uh, these you know, signals, any study about that on human health, uh, these things, because certainly uh, sometimes it becomes frightening that we are just surrounded by it everywhere. We've been exposed to electromagnetic radiation of different sorts for, for many, many years. And there's really no evidence in terms of it causing harm to human health. So I don't think that's something that you should worry about. That's very reassuring. Um, <laughs> just further back there, yeah. 
Uh, hi, fantastic talk. Um, you talked about some great principles for protecting our data while optimizing access, anonymization, encryption, safe havens. It seems like with anything, it gets a little bit more complicated when you try to put this into practice, however. Mm. There are going to be some strong conflicting interests. Let me give you a case example. One of the really interesting things that I think Google discovered last year was that one of the best ways to track um, say a flu outbreak is by watching yeah. what people put into a search engine. And you could imagine that a really powerful application of big data would be um, trying to model our, um, the outbreak of the pandemic. And for that, you're going to want people's information that they're putting into search engines, their um, yeah. location, a lot of information where you lose a lot as soon as you start putting it away in safe havens, where you lose your response time, where you lose a lot when you anonymize it, or kind of Twitter it, uh, Twitter it away. On the other hand, having all of that information readily available is, seems like a major risk to um, people's personal information. Do you have any thoughts on this kind of conflict of interest? Um, I, again, I don't think there are any new principles at work here. You know, one's always balancing risk and benefit. Uh, medical research, I used to chair a, a, a research ethics committee, and always one was balancing the risk on the one hand with the utility. Um, and obviously in the context of medical research, the, the, you know, the vital issue of not causing any harm uh, to uh, volunteers in studies. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure there are, are any new principles and one has to look at these things on a case by case basis. Um, and I mean, there are other challenges too, of course, which is once people started to know what the search terms that Google was interested in, um, in the context of tracking flu, and they, they tried this with dengue too, actually. Um, then people, it has a sort of Heisenberg effect, and people sort of start changing their, 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 their search terms as well. Um, but but I, I don't, there isn't a single magic answer. You have to look at each example on a case-by-case -case basis uh, to work out where the benefits are and where the risks are. And actually, I, it, I, I wonder to some extent where the medical model of the Research Ethics Committee isn't a way of looking at some of this, because that's a mechanism that takes case-by-case judgments around particular proposals. Um, right at the back there. Um, Mark, when you were a junior doctor, you were, if you had breached patient confidentiality, yeah. you would have been, you'd, you'd have received the censure of colleagues and faced into dis disciplinary procedures. I would have been struck profession. off probably. And you yeah. could have been struck off yeah. in the limit. Now how far should we go? in terms of punitive measures, therefore, in society in general, in terms of these breaches, and how are the lawyers going to cope with this? I, I do like your suggestion about the medical ethics format of, of inquiry into it. Well, you see, the safe haven provides that sort of mechanism, actually. So where researchers or others are granted access to data sets which have the potential to be abused by re-identifying people, those safe havens will probably only work properly if they're associated with quite serious penalties for people that misuse them. Um, and so it comes again to where do you have the bottom slider on legislation and accountability. Um, and clearly, egregious breaches of people's privacy has to be treated quite seriously. Um, so I think it is that. It's getting that balance right. The lady over there. Mm. Oh. I'm thinking on the, on the commercial side of the use of data, mm. and I'm wondering whether there is um, any thinking about or indications that uh, people are beginning to think about the fact that you know, all of our clicks have value to somebody, yeah. and whether there's any way of, or there's going to be any ways of monetizing that. Well, people do monetize the but clicks. The I clickers mean, don't monetize them. Sorry? The clickers don't monetize them. Oh, they what? We monetize them ourselves. Um, well, of course, they're. <laughs> um, uh, yes, I mean, in order. So, so the question is actually whether um, Google ought to pay us for the clicks that we. So it's, it's balancing the utility, isn't it? So we get, we get more utility from clicking. Uh, so so the, the economics work in such a way that actually our gain is by clicking um, and what we give in return is a financial return to the, uh, as it were, the, the people that provide the service that enables us to click it in the first place. Um, 
but, but you know, it's open to all of us to... The great thing about the, the World Wide Web is that we can all find ways of implementing so we can all put our own blogs on and make money from the clicks on that. Um, but I, d I don't think us... I think it's an interesting idea that we should charge Google for the privilege of our using it. I don't think that's likely to succeed as an economic model. So it seems like um, a lot of what we're talking about, how to adjust the slider for the risks yeah. and benefits, is about trust. Yes. And, I mean, Richard Nixon was right to trust the FBI, it turns out, because they protected his secrets for many, many years in, in his form. But they didn't employ him. Well, <laughs> even so. So thinking about uh, technology and how quickly things move and how many apps there are that none of us can even yeah. recognize in this room, um, what happens when Facebook goes under? What happens to their data? Is that completely up to Facebook? Is that a worry? Um, well, I mean, the short answer is I don't know what would happen if Facebook went under to their data, and I doubt if anyone in this room knows the answer to that. Um, but I think, the more, the, I think the, the more important issue, in a way, is, is around the issue of trust, which is that, of course, trust is a specific thing. It's not a generic thing. And so, you know, asking the question, do we trust the World Wide Web, isn't a very useful um, do we trust, you can ask, do you trust an individual organization on the World Wide Web? And I mean, that is a legitimate question. Um, and of course, it, it's given that actually many of the organizations that um, we use um, depend on very large numbers of us, they, they, they have quite an incentive actually to behave because if we lose, you know, if we had massive loss of trust in Google, then Google would go under quite quickly actually. Um, so trust is important, but it's not generic. It's got to be in terms of specific contexts, I think. Mm, I just wanted to clarify his question. Yeah, ask your question again. Sorry, it's related to what you've just said. Yeah. Um, if the internet and data have no boundaries or borders, yeah. governments most definitely do, how do you yeah. see regulation, accountability... Ah. And okay, that's issues. sorry. I, if that was your question, I did, I'm sorry, I didn't understand. Sorry, that. I used the term um, governance, and when I um, been, so that is an extremely difficult and live issue at the moment, which is should there be some kind of global regulation and accountability of the World Wide Web and the way we do it? Um, and the short answer is that one is definitely above my pay grade as a scientific advisor. That is a you know, a very, very difficult bit of international diplomacy and politics. Um, and you can imagine that it would not be easy to implement a global agreement around the controls and regulations of the internet, although it's quite easy to see that that could be desirable if it was well done. Um, but I think it is one of the big challenges, uh, and I could certainly see uh, benefits from the ability to be able to do it, but the opportunity cost of achieving it would be very high indeed in political terms. On, on that issue, um, just two, two thoughts you might be interested in. One is that the Oxford Marginal Commission for Future Generations did look at this issue quite carefully and actually made a proposal called CyberX, mm. which is a platform uh, of exchange around this as a stepping stone towards global governance. And the other is that we've just launched the UK Global Cybersecurity Capacity Building Centre uh, in the Oxford Martin School, which um, was opened here uh, about 10 days ago. Uh, and that's exactly one of the questions that we're looking at mm. to, to follow their space. Um, Carol. Hi, I've got one from Twitter, so it's not oh, actually directly Oh, a question from, from Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> um, basically, uh, yeah, um, Ian Yorston has asked, um, how do we address the techno-ignorance of both consumers and legislators to better understand the issues at work? Um, by clear communication, I think is the answer to that. Um, so, uh, and I think that's one of the challenges all the time in, in the public discussion. I, uh, and I, part of my job, I think, is around that clarity of communications, actually. Uh, the, you know, the science and the technology is one thing. Uh, the communications is then very hard, and then the policy decisions are even harder. But I think it's got to be communication. Um, there was a lady with a hand up there. Thank you. Yes, um, you mentioned the, the curly fry intelligence correlation. Oh, yeah. Go on, you tell me the explanation. <laughs> no, but seriously, I was wondering um, that with more data, the, the risk of, or the numbers of spurious correlations goes up yes. dramatically. So could you maybe elaborate a bit on the dangers that that um, brings with it as well? 
Um, well, there are some very good statisticians in the audience who could do this better than me, but I mean, you're absolutely right. As you do more and more uh, correlations, then the probability of getting false positive rises, and then you have to use statistical techniques that take that into account. So if you do a, a, you know, a million comparisons, then, um, and you take a, a, a P of 0 0.5, then you're going to get an awful lot of false positives. Um, so I mean, the answer is you have to use statistical techniques to avoid um, uh, false positives. Um, and you're absolutely right, the curly fries might be just a complete artifact, a coincidence, probably is. Um, let, me, let me just see a show of hands um, if the school wants to uh, ask questions. Before we give you your third. Yes. Yeah, your third. <laughs> are you the last one? Where did you go then with the last question? Actually, there was another one on the right, I don't think. Is there one on the right? Sorry, I thought there was. Is there one on the right? No, maybe not. Um, should governments use um, big data to predict financial recessions or uh, <laughs> other such major governmental decisions? Um, I'm sure that um, um, uh, governments, if they knew how to do it, should use big data to predict recessions because then hopefully they might be able to implement economic policies that might help to prevent them. Um, so, I mean, I guess you know, everyone would like to be able to do that if they can. Um, using data to predict the future is, is obviously fraught with difficulty. But why would government not want to do that if it could? You know, the Treasury tries to provide the best intelligence to government on the economic environment. The Bank of England looks at this, um, and so people ought to be using the best economic information they can. Great. Well, um, thank you, everyone. Uh, this isn't the end of this uh, conversation on big data. We'll be coming back to it. Uh, it will be the focus, in some respects, of our seminar series uh, next term, where we'll look at machine <coughs> and human intelligence and interactions, and it will also be the focus of our seminar series in the Trinity term, which will be on uh, big data and citizen science, uh, with Galaxy Zoo and all the other big projects uh, in that area. So we'll keep uh, thinking about this issue. On Thursday at uh, 3.30, we have Sir John Bennington and Lord Martin Rees uh, winding up our seminar series for this term uh, with uh, reflections on how we deal with some of the biggest <coughs> challenges of the 21st century, building on the work of the Oxford Martin Commission for Future Generations. So uh, I do hope you'll come back uh, on Thursday. Uh, and then that will be followed immediately at 5.30 by Gary Kasparov. Uh, and if there's any mind that is like a machine, uh, in some respects, in that he can do two million uh, transactions apparently per second uh, in his uh, brain, uh, it's Gary. So uh, Gary will be talking at 5.30 on Thursday on mind-machine interfaces and human, uh, how humans can work with machines. So this theme, uh, which is also very related to big data, will continue on Thursday at 3.30 and then um, following that by 5.30. You do need to register on our website uh, for that and come early because I think both will be uh, relatively oversubscribed. So it remains for me to um, invite you for a drink right next door here uh, in the Illy Cafe uh, and its overflow and to thank uh, Sir Mark for a really tremendous lecture and engagement with us in the conversation that followed. Thank you.